Welcome to Our House, the only complete on-air resource for your home ownership needs. Now, here's the host of Our House, Peter Hunt. Good morning and welcome to Our House. This is Peter Hunt and the show is brought to you by HuntRealEstate.com where everything is easier for your home ownership and real estate experience. HuntRealEstate.com is powered by Hunt Real Estate ERE here in Buffalo, Niagara, also in Rochester, Syracuse, the greater Albany area, Watertown, and even Phoenix, Arizona. The show is also brought to you by Hunt Mortgage. Hunt Mortgage is one of the, is the home of the low rate guarantee. So allow one of our mortgage consultants to work with you to find the lowest rate and closing costs for your particular home financing needs guaranteed. You can call Hunt Mortgage at 633-3700 for customized, personalized, knock your socks off service. <clears throat> We're also pleased to announce the first ever 24-7-365 real estate hotline. That's 716-631-4800. That's the Hunt Hotline, which allows you to get any and all information about any property for sale in Buffalo, Niagara, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, Utica, Watertown, Phoenix. All you have to do is pull up in front of the house and, and dial 631-4800. Punch in the street number of the house you want to know about no matter whose listing it is, and the hotline will prompt you with a choice of street names. Select the one you want. You'll hear a brief description, and then you will be text a link to a dedicated website on that particular property. All automatic, fast, anytime in any market we serve on any listing, whether it's ours or any other brokers. I'm pleased to announce also that Hunt is the official real estate and relocation provider of all of our hometown professional teams, the Buffalo Bills, the Buffalo Savers, and the Rochester Americans. We have a very special show for you today. In the studio with me today is the new president of Damon College here in Amherst, New York, Gary Olson. Mr. Olson is a nationally known scholar and writer and educator who's drawn to the leadership position by Damon by its forward-looking curriculum. That's a quote. It is. It is. Good morning, Peter. <laughs> Good morning, Gary. Good to have you here. Um, you know, Gary, we can't help but turn on the television today and, and hear all kinds of things about private education and how costly it is and and really what a pro seemingly a problem it is for or not just private pu public education to what a problem it is on the public side we've got quality issues on the public private side we've got cost issues how d how does it impact your day-to-day -day life i mean is this is it really all the problem it's made out to be or is it or is it uh, just a, the latest thing to talk about yeah it's very much a, a problem and you're right it's both the publics and the privates um, and, and, of course, that's why the president recently announced his uh, new initiatives. Uh, the cost has gone up over the last uh, 20 uh, and even 30 years uh, quite substantially. Uh, I think the problem is that there's uh, not enough uh, careful analysis of what to do about it. Instead, there's a finger pointing as if the colleges uh, are purposely trying to, um, you know, make money on the students when it's not, uh, it's not the case. Really what's going on is as we get more sophisticated in the colleges as to how to deliver uh, an education, uh, it turns out we need more things. So for example, when I, be, uh, when I first began as a professor in, the, uh, in, the, in this world 35 years ago, we didn't have a lot of student support. Uh, but over the years we found that, well, if we're gonna maximize the possibility for students to get through, they need things like a writing center to give them two tutorial kinds of uh, help with their writing, or a math center, let's say, to help them get through math. Um, even a counseling center so that uh, if they have emotional uh, problems and so on, uh, they have somewhere to go. And these all cost a lot of money. Uh, and so uh, over the years, the cost of providing education, uh, a quality education, has risen substantially. Uh, now, when you're in the public sector, uh, it used to be that the state picked up a big part of the tab. So back then, 30 some odd years ago, uh, a lot of the publics could expect maybe to get 70, 75 percent of their budget from the state. Uh, now you can go to most states, it's somewhere around 30 percent, 28 percent. I understand that in Colorado, uh, they're even down to 8 percent. Uh, so in other words, they're, they're operating more as a private than as a public. Uh, so something really needs to be done. The president recently announced some initiatives. I think some are helpful, uh, like the efforts to uh, help students pay off loans and so on. Uh, but I was really hoping for a much more, um, much more of an overhaul, let's say, of the of the system. What would you like to have seen? 
Well, uh, to be honest about it, I think as a society we've lost our um, we've lost the what we had in the Eisenhower days, the Kennedy days, when <clears throat> higher education was a major priority. I don't think it's the major priority that it used to be anymore. And wh uh, why is that? I mean, what's what's changed? It seems to me that, <clears throat> at least having raised four children, that uh, it's a huge priority and, and talked about everywhere. I, is, am I missing something? Well, I mean, uh, take a look at the uh, drop in uh, public uh, funding that I just talked about. I mean, that's, an, that's a concrete indication that uh, we have other priorities uh, that, you know, uh, are more important than this. Uh, so I don't believe that our society has the same level of uh, support uh, for our higher education. If you want an example, <clears throat> when uh, I was a dean in, in another university, uh, I hosted the Minister of Education from Thailand uh, because uh, they were looking into ways that uh, um, they could partner with um, my university and uh, uh, send a lot of uh, young people who were going to become administrators of colleges that were being built in Thailand. Uh, they're building all kinds of colleges and universities because they understand that the future of their country uh, really is tied to having a very highly educated populace. Is there, <clears throat> in your mind, a bit of cynicism out there in the, in the public in terms of how private and public schools have adapted, as you've said, early, as you mentioned earlier, they've got, <clears throat> you know, the uh, director of this and the director of that and, the, you know, uh, all kinds of sensitivities to various aspects of, uh, of, of society that are represented by some new office on campus that all cost money. And I've read recently, uh, you know, some fairly cynical uh, discussions of this. In other words, uh, haven't we lost our focus inside the educational institutions away from education itself and more to this kind of uh, social engineering? Well, <clears throat> there are two things in your question. I mean, one is that uh, there is a, a criticism uh, that colleges are uh, top heavy, uh, that they have uh, too much uh, um, uh, administrative staff. Uh, there may very well be some colleges, some universities that are, but quite frankly, um, what I've seen uh, over these 35 years and, and in a number of different kinds of colleges and universities from very large ones uh, with 50,000 students uh, to now where I am uh, at Damon College with uh, about 3,000 students. Most colleges that I've seen uh, bend over backwards to try to keep the cost down given the context that they're in. Uh, the problem is, as I was mentioning, <clears throat> it costs more to do what used to cost a lot less. Uh, and and that's the the issue. So uh, it's not a matter of uh, well, we're just going to trim out some extra administrators. I mean that might be uh, true in a case uh, by case basis here or there, but uh, that's trying to f point a finger at a place that's not really going to help the larger picture. The larger picture is as a society we really need to decide uh, we want to support higher education. We want to put our money where our miles are. You know, in addition to the uh, hierarchy changes at schools, when I went to college, it was we didn't have a lot of the things that <clears throat> you see in, on the uh, roster at, at schools today in terms of administrative support for some. Let's, that aside, what you didn't see also was the extent of facilities on these campuses. There, there's no question being involved uh, quite closely with at least three schools, to, uh, now four, um, it's just, it's, it's, there's no question there's been a kind of an arms race in terms of who can build the biggest, most beautiful buildings, the most uh, posh dormitories, the, uh, the greatest libraries, resource centers. Now they're, they don't call them libraries anymore. They call them something else. But, <laughs> but the fact of life is that there's this race to, to uh, be latest and greatest on everything. That costs big money, too. Well, if you really do try to be the latest and greatest on everything, it would. But um, I, I think what you're, you're seeing and, and what this is referring to is a kind of a change in how we conceive things. So when you and I went to school, uh, we uh, stayed at what used to be called a dormitory. Uh, you know, dormitory comes from the word dormir, which means to sleep. And quite literally, when we went there, that's all it was. It was a little cell. <laughs> where you had a roommate, you, there were two beds, two desks, that's about all that can fit in there. Uh, you know, you, you went in there, you slept, 
<laughs> and then you went to the dining hall, uh, and it was an like old-fashioned cafeteria and uh, with not much selection, and, and then you just studied. Uh, well, <clears throat> now things have been reconceived. We don't even use the word dormitory anymore. They're residence halls. And the reason is that um, uh, students uh, want and, and really need more uh, uh, these days than they did back then. Uh, residence hall, that using that term, is not just to make it highfalutin. It, it signals something. Uh, the places now where students stay are, uh, yes, you still might have a roommate, but now it may be two or three rooms linked to a little lounge area where you can sit and study uh, and, and, yes, socialize. Uh, uh, the the cafeterias uh, are not called cafeterias any longer. They're dining halls. Why is that? Well, there's more selection. Uh, there's more of a sensitivity to the fact that people have dietary restrictions. Uh, I, I myself have dietary restrictions, and uh, I didn't back then. If I if I had them back then, I'd be in trouble. So uh, if you're a vegetarian or if you can't take uh, uh, milk products, if, you know, the gluten-free, I mean, now, um, you know, all those kinds of issues have to be, uh, and, and by regulation, have to be uh, taken into account because you can't bring a student onto your campus and be completely insensitive to the specific needs that they have. So I don't think that's a, a matter of pandering or, um, you know, just trying to be better than the school down the street. Uh, you know, none of us these days has that kind of money, in other words, to pour money into a building just in order to outdo the other guy. Uh, if we're putting up something new, believe me, uh, there's a very specific strategic reason for it uh, because money is too scarce, even in the colleges that have more money than the other ones. Isn't it... Um doesn't this process that you just described, which <clears throat> which I happen to agree with, um, doesn't it, it, it culminates in higher education just being more expensive, more complex, uh, more stuff going on on campus today than used to go on campuses today. The cost of a sports program has, has skyrocketed. Doesn't this mean that there there will be just even greater differences between the more well endowed schools and the less endowed schools, and won't it, won't it uh, further complicate this issue because uh, th the best education will be limited to to fewer and fewer people well, this is right this is exactly right, and that's why you're seeing um, the disparities uh, that's why the president uh, announced his uh, initiatives. Um, but, you know, there are different ways to, to handle this. Right now, what we're for, forced to do, all of us, uh, every college president, uh, is to spend a lot of our time uh, trying to raise funds externally because, you know, the tuition doesn't cover it. Um, if you're in a state uh, public university, the, the money that you get from the state plus the tuition usually doesn't cover it. Uh, so we're more and more in the... Um, fundraising mode, let's say. Uh, but look, let's say we had something revolutionary. I, I've never heard this uh, uh, proposed this way, but let's say the government decided, as we did in the Kennedy years, you know, uh, we can't be outpaced by China and um, any number of other um, countries that are really pouring money into higher education. Why don't we have a program where the government will provide money, not to the colleges, but to the um, a, a lump sum to the students, and let's tie it with uh, those who graduate rather than uh, trickling it out throughout. Uh, let's let's agree to pay off uh, a huge portion of each student's loan, no matter where they go, a private or public, uh, once they graduate. Uh, they have to graduate, though. Doesn't this isn't this already taking place through the Say Yes program? Uh, well, the Say Yes program uh, is is a step in the right direction. Uh, that that's true. Uh, but if we had a, a big uh, federal program where we really could uh, make it easy for students to go through and to choose where they want to go through, you know, right now, let's say your family is uh, uh, not well off. Uh, Let's say you want to go to a school that costs a lot more than the public school down the street. Uh, you want to go there not just because of the name. You want to go there because they have the particular program and the reputation in that, in that particular program uh, that uh, is what you want to specialize in. Well, you might have to, in the present day, decide that you just can't handle it. 
And so instead, you're going to go for a lot less to the school uh, down the street that doesn't have a good program in your area. Well, students shouldn't have to make that kind of decision. Well, you know, it's, it's because they they shouldn't have to make that kind of decision just because of their phys, their financial well-being or not or right. lack thereof. Okay. Right. Um, this is uh, you're the first private college president I've had on this show in over twenty years now. So well, I'm um, honored. Well, I hope you. I was we're honored to have you here. Um, in the past, we focused on public education, uh, particularly the um, primary education, secondary education, because that, in my mind, is is a great contributor to the uh, well-being of any community. We focused on the Buffalo schools, the the um, suburban schools. We focused on the University of Buffalo, and we, we've I think tried to cover all the programs and, and systems and <clears throat> opportunities that exist out there, and, and as well as the thought process taking place at the governmental level. Um, I wanted you on the show because I wanted to hear how private schools, um, how they fit into this picture. Uh, there's so much talk, particularly in this town, about uh, the importance of the University of Buffalo and its interaction in particular, as far as high-profile things go with the medical campus. Where does where does a private school like Damon fit into that infrastructure? Well, you know, uh, what, what a lot of people may not realize is that not all colleges are uh, created equal. Uh, uh, coming, as I did, from a family that had not uh, gone to college, I wish I had known that as a student because, as far as I knew, uh, you know, they're all the same. You just pick one and you go there. Uh, the fact is that they're not. Um, if you go to a, a large school uh, like uh, UB or the, the much larger one that I mentioned that I had once been for 20 years, which was the University of South Florida, uh, you get a certain experience. If you go to a small college like Damon, uh, you get a, a completely different one. Let me explain. Um, at South Florida, which is a very, very good school, um, it's so large that you literally need a car to get from one end to the other. I mean, unless you're going to walk all day. Um, you may not. Uh, you may go through a whole uh, bachelor's degree without having very many uh, full-time faculty. I mean, they might. Well, let's not say full-time. Let's say part of the regular professoriate. You you may have instructors, you know, which are uh, full-time but temporary. You may have. Uh, graduate students teaching. And these people usually are very good teachers, but it's it's not the same, though, as having that famous pr professor down the hall who is instead teaching graduate students. Well, you take a place like Damon College, a uh, completely different um, kind of experience that you get as a student. Uh, and in fact, I've never seen a place where there's so much hands-on. So not only are the students uh, really taken care of when they're being recruited and, and considering whether they come there, but once they get there and then all the way through, uh, they're taken care of. If, if, if they make the uh, mistake of not calling their advisor, if you're in the big university, they'll say, well, hey, if you're not smart enough to call your advisor, tough luck. Uh, at Damon, they'll call you and say, why aren't you calling me? So it's this level of, of care you can't get that in a lot of places. So the experience in college to college is completely different. I want to come back and talk about that because I want to talk about, I want you to talk about Buffalo as a college town. Um, others that have held similar positions to you <clears throat> at, the, at the public school level have, have talked about really the future of Buffalo as a community being recognized as a college town. I do want to come back and talk about that. I want to remind our listeners that our house is broadcast live here on WBEN. 9.30 a.m. and 107.7 FM. And for those of you who'd like to participate in today's show, if you have any questions or comments about what we're talking about today or any aspect of real estate, call us here in the studio at 803-0930 or 1-800-616-9236. If you're long distance or star 930. If you're mobile, those are all free calls. So call us <coughs> with your questions or comments. And we'll be right back with more from our house tours after these very important messages. <laughs> This is Linda Malaya, president of Hunt Mortgage. It's a seller's market right now, and there just aren't enough homes on the market. Buyers need to be prepared to act quickly, and they need to stand out if there are multiple offers. Having a pre-approval from Hunt, a name realtors and sellers alike trust, can make your offer stand out. Go to HuntMortgage.com and use our convenient online application or call any Hunt office. 
Hunt Mortgage is a licensed mortgage banker, New York Department of Financial Services, and an equal opportunity lender. Welcome back to our house. This is Peter Hunt, and this show is brought to you by HuntRealEstate.com, where everything is easier for your real estate and home ownership experience. HuntRealEstate.com is the only place on the web where you can find a complete inventory of homes available here in Buffalo, Niagara, also in Rochester and Syracuse, Greater Albany, Utica, and even Phoenix, Arizona. And you'll also find access to a complete set of homeownership services at HuntRealEstate.com, which is powered by Hunt Real Estate ERA. The show is also brought to you by Hunt Mortgage, and you just heard from the president of Hunt Mortgage, Linda Malaya. And for more information about any of our exclusive programs, including the one that allows you to buy the before and live the after, allows you to roll the cost of the home improvements into your mortgage, which is a, a tremendous opportunity in, in a town like this where we've got you know, an older housing stock. It gives you an opportunity to be able to visualize not only what your home will look like, but what it will cost in the end, and to roll all that into your mortgage, 633 3700. Also ask about our warm home loan as well, where you're not only provided with a mortgage suited your particular needs, but also uh, a pet. It's a wonderful opportunity. And if you'd just like to pick up the phone and ask any question about real estate, call the Hunt Customer Service Center, the only one of its kind in North America, 633-9400. One of our customer service reps will instantly direct you to the appropriate professional for whatever it is you may need, whether you're considering buying or selling a home, financing a home, insuring a home, or even fixing up the one you have. And remember, our guarantee stands, we will sell your home or ERA will buy it. That's the seller security plan available only through a Hunt agent. Stop into one of our open houses or look for Ed in the Buffalo News Home Finder or call the Customer Service Center today. I'm in the studio today with Gary Olson. Dr. Olson is the sixth president, recently named sixth president of Damon College. And we've been discussing, um, kind of began the show by discussing kind of um, the the ch- greatest challenge, at least publicly, that we hear about, the greatest challenge to education today, which is its cost. Um, <clears throat> and, that, and then we've kind of morphed into the place for private education in, in, a, in a community like Buffalo or any community where, where we have um, uh, obviously strong public institutions as well. But before we get to that, Gary, we do have a caller on the line. This is Frank from Holland. You've been waiting patiently. Frank, how can we help you? Good morning, sir. I, I just had a remark on your uh, your say yes uh, uh, statement. Yes, I'm just kind of worried how say yes is going to run in the long run. Mm-hmm. I worry that it's going to affect only the big cities that are uh, usually associated with the failing school districts, mm-hmm. and they only apply to those big cities. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, that that leaves out, let's say, my suburban community and my suburban kids and. And, you know, it just seems to be going back to the old practice of, you know, let's play catch up with a certain, um, how do I say, a demographic, whereas, you know, it should apply to everybody equally. Like the schools Mm -hmm. should be equal assets, equal funding, equal everything for every kid. It's not the kid's fault that they live in a poor uh, tax base. Mm -hmm. It's not their fault. It should be equal for everybody. And I worry that... Um, programs like Say Yes are, are greatly intentioned, and I really like them, but I worry that that's where they're going to run in the long run. Well, you, you raise an interesting topic, and <clears throat> it has been brought up before. Um, I guess there, there, Dr. Olson touched on this earlier about making this more universal than just applying to a particular um, geography. But uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Olson to respond to that. But I, I think the, the point is, at least among the people that I've spoken to, is, is, is starting with the most disadvantaged or, or the least successful school systems, and then hopefully this is something could, that could morph th- throughout the entire site. How, how do you feel about that, Gary? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I'm not a, a specialist on this program in, uh, in particular, but, I mean, I think it's doing good and, and – uh, I think everything that we can do to get people into and then through uh, college is is important. And I'm sure this is not enough. So I think the caller is making a point. Let's shift gears back to what I wanted to get to just before the break, and that is uh, the notion of Buffalo as a college town and and what how, what the value of that is to to our community as a whole in terms of our identity and also in terms of the of the quality of life in this community. Uh, obviously, you, you chose to come here. Um, 
Uh, obviously, you had other choices in your life. Um, how did that, or did it play into your thinking? It, yeah, it did very much. In fact, statistics I've seen show that uh, the Buffalo, the greater Buffalo area, has one of the uh, highest um, uh, educated uh, populaces in the nation. I think, you know, Cambridge uh, in, in Boston is uh, way up there at the top, but uh, uh, we're not too far behind that, I think. Uh, what's important about that is that this has a direct economic impact on uh, on the area. Um, the likelihood that people will be employed if they have a college uh, uh, degree is much, much higher uh, than if they don't. Uh, for example, in July of uh, uh, this year, the unemployment rate was 7.6% uh, for high school graduates who uh, never went to college and just 3.8% for college grads. I mean, that's a big difference. So, um, And also, as we are trying to rebuild the economy here, and we are. I think it's really moving forward in major ways. But as we do that, uh, we're going to need these highly educated, highly trained uh, people that uh, only really the colleges can uh, can produce. Uh, so really our future is tied uh, to uh, this uh, particular, uh, you know, to, the, to that particular demographic. It's also tied, frankly, to the, uh, to the value of our real estate. I mean, this may sound a little that ridiculous, is, true. but no, it is. But if you if you look around the country and you look at communities where values are are highest, you've got some built in um, uh, community val built in value in some communities like uh, Manhattan or you know parts of the Los Angeles market or Chicago. And the major metropolitan areas tend to be more expensive and not maybe not more valuable, it's certainly more expensive. But if you go down to the next, next rung down, you say, what's, what communities have strong values, and, and why are those values uh, there? And you can pick some strange little parts of this country that happen to be the home of some great institutions, and you can see that the, that the value is, is significantly higher there than the next town over. Um, you've seen several communities like this, Dr. Olson. How, how would you... How, how, how does it relate in your mind, the, the, the presence of these institutions and the, and, and the value of, of value in general in the community? Uh, I think they're really tied together. Uh, in, in fact, I mean, a lot of colleges will use, um, I mean, it goes both ways. The, the, the colleges will use the um, quality of life in a particular area, which includes, you know, the affordability of housing and so on, as a recruitment for a uh, tool for uh, faculty and administrators. And of course, as uh, a college uh, grows and more faculty and administrators <laughs> move to the area, uh, then that has a direct impact on, on the housing market. I think this is really important. And they're educated and they're generally fairly well That's paid. Right. That's right. And they bring a lot to the, to, the, uh, to the economy. Let me give you an example. So we're a very small school, 3,000 students. Uh, yet we have uh, an annual uh, economic impact on the area of $114 million a year. I mean, that's, that's, that's important. Now, that's not anything of what uh, UB's impact is likely to be, but still, it's pretty significant. So it, it's really a symbiotic relationship. Not to mention the, uh, the fact that colleges tend to be uh, centers for arts, um, science, uh, things like that that, that um, that are attractive to many elements of, of the community outside of the college itself. Uh, for example, on Damon's campus is a theater that draws lots of people in from the public. That's right, musical theater. Uh, that, that's right. S see, this you, you touch on a very important point, Peter. Uh, I, I think in the discourse about college and college affordability, <coughs> something gets missing. Uh, they talk about often colleges as if it's simply workforce training. So in other words, almost as if it's just an extension of high school. You know, you're, you're just going to go a few more years and get a better job, and that's it. But the fact of the matter is colleges and, researchers are mu uh, and research universities are much more than, um, than that. Uh, they are uh, incubators of uh, innovation. You know, if we're going to cure cancer, let's say, or, or develop a new uh, thing that we had never envisioned before, it's likely to happen in a college or university uh, setting. 
Uh, it's the faculty and even the students working on this project or, the, or that project. Uh, so the universities play a role way beyond simply training somebody to do a job. Look at uh, Stanford in the Silicon Valley. That's right. There you go. I mean, that's the perfect example. Unbelievable financial impact. Uh, I mean, let me give you an, a more local example, too. Uh, everybody probably saw all the average, uh, the um, uh, publicity uh, when the lieutenant governor came here and made a big announcement about the Buffalo Billion. Uh, and they announced that uh, they were going to give $4.5 million uh, to Damon College and to a private uh, concern, a startup concern that was uh, uh, partnering with us. Uh, and this had to do with uh, animation and films. Okay, So uh, why is this important, and what did the uh, news uh, focus on? Well, they focused on uh, a comment one of the uh, principals uh, made that, well, this, this could lead to 150 jobs uh, in the next uh, four or five years. Well, that's true, but they missed the main point that uh, is behind all this. The governor's vision is much bigger than this. The governor is hoping that this is the beginning of uh, a whole new industry here in, in Buffalo, a whole new post-production film industry in the same way that, you know, a decade and a half or two decades, whenever it happened uh, ago, that uh, uh, Toronto ma managed to get all the filmmakers to go there. So um, this could really be a shot in the arm to the economy in a huge way, not 150 jobs, you know, 10 times that or more. So that's what we're hoping for, and that's what you get when you get the colleges and, you know, business working together for the community. And it's, it's very interesting because there's, there's <clears throat> various phases that a concept or an idea or new technology go through before they become commercially viable. And if it were not for our institutions of higher education, where would that happen? Yeah, that's right. The only place it could happen is in a, uh, a paid laboratory and uh, under very uh, uh, strict uh, kinds of conditions. And, and the same expense. It's not going to yeah. be any less expensive to do it that way. That's right. Which, which is interesting. When we come back, uh, Gary, I want you to comment on the, uh, the kind of growing uh, popularity of virtual education. And the impact on schools like yours and even the, the University of Buffalo, schools like that, how will that impact learning experience? How will it impact all the things we just talked about in terms of the business and, and the colleges working together? And to me, this is, this is a crucial topic at this point in time as technology explodes. And we'll be right back with more from our Austeers after these important messages. This is Linda Malaya, president of Hunt Mortgage. It's a seller's market right now, and there just aren't enough homes on the market. Buyers need to be prepared to act quickly, and they need to stand out if there are multiple offers. Having a pre-approval from Hunt, a name realtors and sellers alike trust, can make your offer stand out. Go to HuntMortgage.com and use our convenient online application or call any Hunt office. Hunt Mortgage is a licensed mortgage banker, New York Department of Financial Services, and an equal opportunity lender. Welcome back to our house. This is Peter Hunt, and this show is brought to you by HuntRealEstate.com, where everything is easier for your real estate and home ownership experience. This show is also also brought to you by Hunt Mortgage. Hunt Mortgage is the home of the low rate guarantee, and you can reach them at 633-3700 for a knock your socks off service. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of service in this process. It's not that simple going through the mortgage process today. It's not just an interest rate. It is it is counseling with you to make sure you're getting the best possible opportunity for a long time long term experience and it may have to do with making sure your credit is clean or working with you to get it to that level and that can only happen through a consulting process that will only happen through an organization like Hunt Mortgage 633-3700 I'm in the studio today with Gary Olson Dr. Olson is the president the new president of Damon College a noted scholar on rhetoric writing and culture and I'd like to uh, go back to what I, where we left off just before the break, Gary. I wanted you to comment on <clears throat> the kind of, a, a, at least in, this, in the higher education circles, a very, very significant issue, which is the issue of the growth of virtual education and its impact on residential uh, institutions like yours. Yeah, it, it's big. We're in a, a time of transition. We, of course, now have this new thing, which is a profit uh, uh, totally online co a college. We have 
uh, all of the uh, uh, big universities uh, being in one way or another into online kinds of um, uh, course offerings. Uh, some places you can get full degrees uh, and even full courses, I mean, for, uh, full courses and even full degrees uh, online. Um, you know, it's hard to tell what the future is going to be because a lot is gained, but a lot is lost. You know, what's gained is you have increased access for people that might not have had uh, the ability to uh, take courses. So, for example, in, a lots of, uh, in lots of parts of the country where you're in rural areas, uh, you may not be able to get uh, uh, to the college that's, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles away uh, for all your courses. And the, having the ability to pick up some courses uh, that way, uh, you know, may mean the difference between you're eventually getting a degree and not. So that's good. Um, the danger is that uh, college w colleges will really exploit this and uh, use it as a way simply to uh, have revenue coming in without the same kind of quality going out. Uh, and by quality, I mean... It's not that uh, online is necessarily a, a lower quality, but you lose a certain thing when when uh, you don't have uh, the kind of one-to-one -one, uh, experience that you have when you sit in the college classroom. Uh, that's why a lot of experts now believe that the so-called hybrid is the best uh, model. And by hybrid, they usually mean, you know, you might take a course and some of it is online, some of it is meeting with the professor and, and your uh, fellow students and getting into discussions and so on. Is this as, as much a response to the cost of education, Gary, as anything else? Because, like you say, there's access, physical access. If I'm in a rural setting and, and my family just doesn't have the money to physically send me someplace for four years to get an education, um, is this is this an alternative for for people like that? I mean, you touched on that earlier, but but is this a a one of the byproducts of this of the simply the high cost of education? I think it's that, and it's also the um, the need that a lot of people have to try to be innovative and do things differently and to see how they work. Mm -hmm. uh, and and both uh, both are important. Uh, and you know, you, we have to ag agree probably that there are uh, some. Uh, disciplines and some kinds of courses within disciplines uh, that are perfectly uh, uh, suitable to uh, just online. So, for example, at another institution uh, that I'd been, uh, there was a, a complete course in uh, forensic uh, um, uh, science for uh, uh, basically for people that are already working in um, law enforcement and judges and so on. And so they can come and get a certificate and uh, not come, but they uh, could pay. Uh, the tuition <laughs> and through the online um, uh, course, uh, get a certificate on how does blood spatter, uh, uh, splatter uh, analysis work and so on. And, uh, and, you know, that's perfectly fine to see it on the screen and you can replay it and replay it and look at how it works and, uh, and then read the course materials that go with it. Uh, but then there are other kinds of courses, for example, my own discipline of English where you're, you're learning uh, uh, reading and writing, literature, and all kinds of uh, things al along that sort. Uh, well, you know, s s there may be some applications that work online, but, y you know, if you just have it online, you're going to lose too much. So I think so long as we go forward, we're, judi you're, we're judicious <coughs> and uh, we're uh, instituting a kind of quality control, this might be a good thing. If instead we're just worried about the bottom line, it could very easily become a bad thing. The bottom line to me on this is that it's access to knowledge, and it's how we how this plays out. I think will just be a matter of experience. Uh, people will learn either it'll it'll work in some instances like you describe, and I mean I can't imagine it working in a chemistry lab, mm. or, or even in a music lab or something like that. I, I just can't imagine it working. But uh, and also the the other element of this too, and and I'd like you to just comment on this as well. Schools like Damon, and there's. In New York State, we have a lot of schools like this that that they they tout the the residential experience. Mm -hmm. There is a there is a difference from between living in your same bedroom that you grew up in and taking your courses online than being on campus away from your family, where you've got to start to learn to be an independent uh, human being. 
at the same time you've got access to smart people, educated people, resources you'll never have access to again in that kind of existence. Comment on that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you, you know, it's almost a cliche to say that your, your four years of college, uh, even if you go on to graduate school, it doesn't matter. The f- four years of college, when you get your bachelor's degree, uh, are the most important time of your life because that's when you're growing the most. That's when you're learning to become your own person away from your family. And uh, the experience of being at, at a college does that. Uh, and in fact, it's funny you say this because I always used to tell people who asked me for advice about going to college, uh, never go, and this may sound funny to some people, but if you can, never go to the college down the street. So if you live down the street from Yale, literally, you better go to Harvard. Why? Because you need the, the experience of being out of your usual circumstances and in another one. And what you're alluding to as well is that, uh, you know, you, you gain an identity with your college. So you become a Harvard guy or a Yale woman. You know, you, you really start to, to feel a part of that community. That's what I like about Damon. I mean, you know, we, we have that friendly atmosphere and it's small enough. And so people come out of it quite literally, and they say this, quite literally feeling that they belong to a, a family. And you don't get that uh, if you're just taking all your courses online. I wonder if, if that was part of your commentary, uh, your message when you spoke to the at the Damon commencement. What was your message? Well, my message there was that <clears throat> uh, what's important what you should take away from college is not uh, just uh, your particular discipline. You know, so if you're going to become a chemist, uh, sure, you better know how chemistry works. Uh, but the important thing above and beyond that is a habit of mind, a way of thinking, a way of uh, being able to confront the world and to uh, think about it analytically and make good judgments about it. And that's that's something, by the way, you can't learn <laughs> just on, on, online. That's something that takes years and, and classrooms and, and arguing with your professors and arguing with your friends, not arguing in a bad way, but you know, working, working things yeah, out, sure. debating. Uh, and uh, that's what, in a lot of ways, college is most about. You know, you might learn more in your, in your residence hall uh, debating your, your roommate uh, than you might in some courses. That's what the college education is all about. You know, what I like to think about <clears throat> when I think about the college experience more than anything is that your mind may not yet be made up. And it gives you an opportunity to debate, discuss, present a point of view, have someone poke holes in it. Because once you get out of that environment and you get into work environment, uh, social environment, I, I find people tend to harden in their in their ways of thinking. And to have that opportunity for however many years where, you know, maybe I'm not totally convinced that my position is right. I I'm, I'm think I'm right, but mm-hmm. I'm not totally convinced. And to me, that's one of the exciting things about college. That's right. And that's critical thinking. And that's what you should be able, if, if your education was a good one, that's what you should be able to take away with you after college. So uh, 20 years later, uh, just as you are today, uh, although it's probably a few more than 20 years old, uh, you, 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 still have, <laughs> you still have uh, that ability to uh, confront things and, and uh, say, well, am I really right here? Let me, let me rethink this. Well, that's why I like doing this show, frankly. Right. I get to have smart people like you on the air so we can talk about things like this. But in our last couple of minutes, um, I'd like to tie this back to the mission of the show, which is to help our listeners protect and enhance their investment in real estate right here in western New York and anywhere that people may be listening to this show. Um, we talked about Buffalo as a college town. You mentioned the economic impact of Damon at $114 million, which is huge. Um, beyond that, how, how does this town and gown thing uh, really benefit somebody who might just be on the periphery of it or not be involved at all? How, how, what would you say to somebody to sell them on why Damon is important? Why Damon is important? Well, well or any school like you. Or, yeah. Uh, well, in particular, Damon is important, I think, because you have an unprecedented level of uh, hands on uh, uh, between the student and the faculty and the staff. Uh, you know, the, the ratio of faculty to staff there is 14 to 1. The average class size is 18. 
quite literally when I was a professor at, an, at a university, uh, I taught courses with 300 students in it. And that's in English, not in some of the sciences where you might expect that sometimes in an introductory science course. So um, the, the love, I find that those students who think that they could be excited about a big university with lots of people around and lots of hustle and bustle, well, then, you know, maybe you want, might want to go to a school. But you run the danger also of just being a number. But if you think you might uh, really rather be part of a family, then a place like Damon really fills that need. And that's why different colleges have different missions uh, and uh, uh, are you know, better fits for some people than others. How is your, how is your class coming in? My class this year? Yes. How's it, how's it, look it, like? it looks great. Uh, I, I know a lot of the uh, other colleges are, are uh, struggling and uh, have sort of dipped into their second tier of uh, applicants. But uh, we had, you know, I just found out uh, two days ago that for one of our supreme, uh, supremely good uh, programs, which is a physician's assistant, we had over 900 applications for 22 slots. Wow. And that's, uh, that really tells you something about the quality. I was contacted by some of those people. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, uh, Gary Olson, soon to be inaugurated sixth president of Damon College. Thank you very much for being with us this thank morning. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to thank our listeners, too. I'd also like to say hello to my Aunt Martha, who's busy getting better and, and out in Orchard Park. And I want to thank all our listeners, all of you that have been so kind to come up and speak to me personally when you've had the chance and tell me what you think of this show and, you know, also offer your criticisms as well. I'm very interested. Uh, please uh, contact me with your questions or comments at hunt, peter.hunt at huntrealestate.com. I'd be happy to respond to you directly, and I do appreciate any input you have on this show. Gary Olson, Dr. Gary Olson, thank you for being with us. Me, me thank you, one. Peter. I'd like to thank our listeners. We'll be back again next week. And remember, when it comes to real estate, Western New York is hunt country.